Welcome to story time. I'm so glad you could join me. Today, I'll be reading from the journal of Captain Frederick Marriott. And these journal entries are from 1792 to 1848. So without further ado, let's dive in and see what the good captain had to say. I like to begin at the beginning. It's a good old fashion, not sufficiently adhered to in these modern times. I recollect a young gentleman who said he was thinking of going to America. On my asking him, how he intended to go. He replied, I don't exactly know, but I think I shall take the fast coach. I wished him a safe passage and said I was afraid he would find it very dusty. As I could not find the office to put myself by this young gentleman's conveyance, I walked down to St. Catherine's Docks. Went on board a packet. Was shown into a superb cabin. Fitted up with bird's eye maple, mahogany, and looking glasses. And communicating with certain small cabins where there was a sleeping berth for each passenger, about as big as that allowed to a pointer in a dog kennel. I thought that there was more finery than comfort. But it ended in my promising the captain to meet him at Portsmouth. He was to sail from London on the 1st of April, 1837, and I did not choose to sail on that day. It was ominous. So I embarked at Portsmouth on the 3rd. It is not my intention to give a description of crossing the Atlantic, but as the reader may be disappointed if I do not tell him how I got over, I shall first inform him that we were 38 in the cabin and 160 men, women, and children literally stowed in bulk in the steerage. I shall describe what took place from the time I first went up the side at Spithead until the ship was under way and then make a very short passage of it. At 9.30 a.m., embarked on board the good ship Quebec, and a good ship she proved to be, repeatedly going nine and a half knots on a bowling, sails lifting, Captain H. quite delighted to see me. All captains of packets are to see passengers. I believed him when he said so. At 9.50, sheriff's officer, as usual, came on board, observed several of the cabin passengers hasten down below, and one who requested the captain to stow him away. But it was not a pen and ink affair. It was a case of burglary. The officer has found his man in the steerage. The handcuffs are on his wrists, and they are rowing him ashore. He 
His wife and two children are on board. Her lips quiver as she collects her baggage to follow her husband. One half hour more and he would have escaped from justice and probably have led a better life in a far country where his crimes were unknown. By the by, Greenacre, the man who cut the women up, was taken out of the ship as she went down the river. He had very nearly escaped. What cargoes of crime, folly, and recklessness do we yearly ship off to America? America ought to be very much obliged to us. The women of the steerage are persuading the wife of the burglar not to go on shore. Their arguments are strong, but not strong enough against the devoted love of a woman. Your husband is certain to be hung. What's the use of following him? Your passage is paid. You will have no difficulty in supporting your children in America. But she rejects the advice, goes down the side, and presses her children to her breast as overcome with the agony of her feelings, she drops into the boat. And now that she is away from the ship, you hear the sobs, which can no longer be controlled. Ten AM All hands up anchor. I was repeating to myself some of the stanzas of Mrs. Norton's Here's a Health to the Outward Bound when I cast my eyes forward. I could not imagine what the seamen were about. They appeared to be pumping instead of heaving at the windlass. I forced my way through the heterogeneous mixture of human beings, animals, and baggage, which crowded the decks. And discovered that they would, it's illegible, so I'll just skip over it. A very ingenious and superior invention. The seamen, as usual, lighten their labor with the song and chorus forbidden by the etiquette of a man of war. The one they sung was peculiarly musical, although not refined. And the chorus of, oh, Sally Brown, was given with great emphasis by the whole crew between every line of the song, sung by an athletic young third mate. I took my seat on the night heads, turned my face aft, looked and listened. Heave away there, forward. Aye, aye, sir. Sally Brown, oh, my dear Sally, oh, Sally Brown, Sally Brown of Bubble Alley. Oh, Sally Brown, a vast heaving there, send all aft to clear the boat. Aye, aye, sir. Where are we to stow these casks, Mr. Fisher? Stow them, heaven knows, get them in. At all events, Captain H, Captain H, there's my piano still on deck. It will quite spoil, indeed it will. Don't be alarmed, ma'am, 
as soon as we're underway, we'll hoist the cow up and get the piano down. What? Under the cow? No, ma'am, but the cow is over the hatchway. Now then, my lads, forward to the windlass. I went to town to get some toddy, oh, Sally Brown. I wasn't fit for anybody, oh, Sally Brown. Out there and clear away the jib, I aye, sir. Mr. Fisher, how much cable is there out? Plenty yet, sir. Heave away, my lads. Sally is a bright mulatto. Oh, Sally Brown, pretty girl, that can't get at her. Oh, Sally Brown. Avast heaving, we send the men aft to whip the ladies in. Now, miss, only sit down and don't be afraid, and you'll be in in no time. Whip away, my lads, handsomely, stead her with the guy. Lower away. There, miss, now you're safely landed. Landed, am I? I thought I was shipped. Very good indeed, very good, miss. You'll make an excellent sailor, I see. I should make a better sailor's wife, I expect, Captain H. Excellent. Allow me to hand you aft. You'll excuse me. Forward now, my men, heave away. Seven years I courted Sally. Oh, Sally Brown. Seven more of shilly shally. Oh, Sally Brown. She won't wed. A vast heaving up there and loose the topsails. Stretch along the topsail sheets. Upon my soul, half these children will be killed. Whose child are you? I don't know. Go and find out. That's a dear. Let fall. Sheet home. Belay starboard sheet. Clap on the larboard. Belay all that. Now then, Mr. Fisher. Aye, aye, sir. Heave away, my lads. She won't wed a Yankee sailor. Oh, Sally Brown. Oh, Sally Brown. Heave away, my men. And in sight. Hurrah, my lads. Sally Brown. Oh, my dear Sally. Oh, Sally Brown. Sally has crossed old granny. Oh, heave and fall. Jib halyards hoist away. Oh dear, oh dear. Where shall I put her? Oh, anywhere just now. Put her on the turkey coop. Starboard. I say, clap on, some of you, he chaps or else get out of the way. Sailor, mind my bandbox. Starboard, starboard it is, steady so. Thus, with the trifling matter of maiming half a dozen children, upsetting two or three women, smashing the lids of a few trunks, and crushing some bandboxes as flat as a muffin, the good ship Quebec was at last fairly under way and standing out for St. Helens. Three PM off St. Helens. Ship steady, little wind, water smooth, passengers sure. They won't be sick. Three twenty. Apologies from the captain 
for a cold dinner on this day. Four o'clock, dinner over. Everybody pulls out a number of Pickwick. Everybody talks and reads Pickwick. Now they're getting up squalid. Passengers not quite so sure they won't be seasick. Who can tell what the morrow may bring forth? It brought forth a heavy sea, and the passengers were quite sure that they were seasick. Only six out of thirty-eight made their appearance at the breakfast table, and for many days afterwards there were pickwicks in plenty strewed all over the cabin, but passengers were very scarce. But we had more than seasickness to contend with. The influenza broke out and raged. Does not this prove that it is contagious and not dependent on the atmosphere? It was hard after having sniffled with it for six weeks on shore that I should have another month of it on board. But who can control destiny? The ship was like a hospital. An elderly woman was the first victim. Then a boy of 12 years of age. Fortunately, there were no more deaths. But I have said enough of the passage. On the 4th of May, in the year of our Lord, 1837, I found myself walking up Broadway among the free and enlightened citizens of New York. And there you have it, the first installment in Captain Frederick Marriott's journal, dated 1792 through 1848. In my next installment, we'll be reading about his adventures in New York. I can't wait to see you again.